It so, looks like you're huddling together for warmth. <laughs> Well, I do welcome you <laughs> to Hemel Hempstead Methodist Church. Um, and indeed, there are, hopefully, or well, there will be people um, watching the recording later. So welcome to those of you who are not physically in this building, but who are interested in the Lent lectures. This is the third of our 2023 lectures. And um, the theme is always what is on your heart. But the theme for this year is the work of chaplaincy. Um, I don't really need to introduce you to the Reverend Andrew Brazier. <laughs> um, and unlike all of the other people who are coming to talk, he's going to manage to talk about something that he's not done. <laughs> Which is an achievement in itself, I think. Um, and what I will say to you, Andrew, is that I'm a railway child because both of my parents spent the whole of their working, paid working lives working for the railway. Um, and I spent a lot of time on trains over the years. I've never, ever met a railway chaplain, so I'm very interested to hear about the potential and also the work that they do. I'm not going to say any more. I'm going to hand it over to you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Um, well, good evening. Um, it's lovely to see. Oh, I've just, I can hear myself echoing. I'll try not to be too boomy. Um, I think I've got my first slide up there. Thank you, Lindsay. She's going to try and keep up with what I'm, well, as I waffle on. As, um, as Caroline quite rightly pointed out, I'm not coming to you with something that I've done specifically, but I'm hoping to present to you tonight an idea. And the idea is based around railway or um, uh, transport chaplaincy. And it's something I've been exploring for a long time. Um, the idea of, very simply, how do we talk to people who would not normally come anywhere near a church? And what I want you to do to start tonight is, as much as possible, try not to think of me as me, but as a mission enabler presenting to you an idea. Also, I, as you will see here, I want you to try and imagine a world in which the church as we currently know it doesn't exist. Because one of the problems that we have whenever we start talking about mission or when we start talking about chaplaincy is that, uh, or church um, is that we have a 2,000-year-old model which we are embedded into. And like the taxi driver who, when asked directions, says, I wouldn't have started from here, I am effectively saying, well, I wouldn't have started from here. On top of that, um, there is also, of course, um, a fundamental issue about where we would meet people. When the church first started out uh, in Britain, we were the recipients of travellers coming from other countries bringing Christianity to us. And on the way here, they collected people, gathered people, and then started to form communities. And the shape and form of those churches that they made were both based on the world that they found in Britain when they arrived. And those of you that have been to Linda's Farm and so on will know what it was like, that there was a, a certain type and a way that churches were being built and so on. But we were built into a community that was static. We built churches into areas where people lived or came to live and then stayed for the vast majority of their lives. And that world doesn't exist anymore. But the model of our church is entirely based on a non-transient community. And actually, most of the world that we live in now is transient. People don't live in the same place all their lives. Most of you here will have probably come from somewhere else to arrive in Hemel Hempstead. Uh, no, one or two maybe are committed long-term members of Kings Langley or whatever, but, but on the whole, the majority of people will move many, many times in their lives and spend a lot of time traveling from point A to point B. So we start with the journey. Now, um, in my next slide, you will see a picture of two journeys. I don't know which one of those strikes you as being harder or easier than the other. 
I guess running down a beach on soft sand might be hard work. But suffice to say that whichever way we go on a journey together, we do so as Christians, and let's face it, we are meeting as Christians tonight. Um, we do so um, knowing that Christ is on that journey with us. And that's an important thing too, because part of what we do with chaplaincy, well, that's a good question. Maybe we should just have the next slide. Maybe we root all of our church life in tradition. You see, when I start talking about railway chaplaincy, and I have worked alongside um, the chaplain for the railway between Paddington and Penzance, what used to be known as God's Wonderful Railway, the GWR. And in my head, railways look like this. But that's also a problem, isn't it? Because in all honesty, if we go out into the world and if we do transport chaplaincy, it's probably not going to look like that. It's probably going to be grubby DMU units scuttling up and down the railway. And certainly my experience when I did this project was to uh, be traveling on a variety of different trains, some considerably worse than others. It's probably worth saying also that this was my sabbatical project. It took pl place between June and September 2019, and I had to present a question. And my question, and my, my, my theory, my question was this. Overarching this whole piece is the question, how do we talk to those who won't come anywhere near the church? I think it's fair to say that ministry for me has always included the edge folk. Sometimes it's included the downright anti-church folk. From youth work to chaplaincy, I found myself doing something of a translation job. Nobody speaks church anymore. It seems that we do not live in a faithless world. It's just that people don't necessarily attribute that faith to a church. Perhaps because of this, it also seemed that chaplaincy and the street pastoring models gather far higher numbers than traditional church. So having worked in different chaplaincies and worked with my friend on the, mod on the model railway, on the railway to Penzance, the words will get there in the end, uh, my friend is called Max, and she used to be the chaplain for that whole great line. And what we both have experienced in our chaplaincy models is that we deal with far higher numbers of people through chaplaincy than you would necessarily deal with in a church. The university chaplaincy that I'm talking about in my next talk, turnover each week was around 1,800 people through the chaplaincy every week. And the building was smaller than this. So it was busy and frenetic. Railway chaplaincy, there was too much work for Max. In the end, a lot of Max's work was just turning up to people's baptisms, weddings and funerals uh, and, and taking services because she didn't have time to be with all the people on such an enormous stretch. And that brings us to a very key point, which is if we have, uh, yes, railway chaplaincy, is what do we mean when we say a chaplain? What do we actually expect a chaplain to do? I know I'm projecting an idea tonight, but in the models that you've seen before in these talks, um, we had the Anna chaplain who was going into homes and was speaking to a particular demographic. Um, the, 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 the older members, the, the, the elderly, uh, whatever the kosher phrase is for it these days. Um, when we had, uh, what was the other one we had? School, Vindra, coming and talking to us about schools. She was in a very particular place. And the people were already there. So I guess one part of chaplaincy is that you're going out of the church and into a particular place. But what do you expect the chaplain to do once you've got one? Hi, we have a chaplain. What do you think that they will get up to? I guess we sit and listen. We hear people's troubles and, and struggles. We answer impossible questions. Uh, one thing that'll come up in my next talk is the students and what questions they tended to bring. Very, very difficult, impossible questions. So, this is the premise of the talk tonight, is simply that I want to present an idea 
that might make our churches all the basis for a form of chaplaincy. But that that form of chaplaincy is much more universal than just employing a chaplain. Because obviously the problem is, if you look at the railway chaplain example, if Max has to cover everywhere from Paddington to Penzance, that chaplain is not big enough. There's not enough chaplains. Um, there never is. There wasn't enough chaplains at the university. Um, you can't, I mean, those of you who do street pastors, you could probably do, you could have ten times the number of street pastors, and for every person that was doing a bit more chaplaincy, you'd have more people wanting to talk to them. It's that kind of, it's like some sort of ever-increasing maths. If we could just find a way of making that work in the church... I feel like we could grow the church radically because if we could have enough people ministering to enough different areas and different groups of people, the church wouldn't be us or folks at home, wherever the camera is, it, or the folks, you know, it wouldn't just be us. It would be a vast array of people reaching out into the community and working as a team. I'll come back to that. Um, next slide, please. Um, I don't know if you can see, it's a bit small, but it says up there, personality, opportunity, and vulnerability. The last line says, two out of three ain't bad, which any of you who know Meatloaf uh, is a line from the song, um, I love you, I, I, I need you, I want you, uh, but I don't love you, and two out of three ain't bad. Personality, I don't mean that you have to be a lunatic like me. Okay. What you bring to chaplaincy, if a person is going to be a chaplain, is who you are. Um, I was hoping Donna was going to be here so that I could tease her. If she's watching at home, um, then um, Donna, as you know, comes from North Carolina, and uh, she has this lovely accent, and I was going to try and take off her accent. But in drag racing circles in America, there is a phrase... It's run what you brung. You run what you brung. You can turn up at the drag racing of, uh, event and you can take your own car down the drag racing strip, okay? And almost everybody who comes to those events says, oh no, my car is far too slow. I wouldn't, it, I wouldn't put it on the strip. And what the, the organizers say is, no. You run what you brung. You turn up and you drive your car and see how fast it will go, just for fun. And just because you're not going to win doesn't mean that you don't do it. You have a laugh. You turn up and you join in and you're part of it. In terms of chaplaincy, it's really important that you run what you brung. You bring what you have to the equation. And it means that anybody and everybody has the potential to be a chaplain. Opportunity. Some opportunities are already there, a school, a residential home. Sometimes you have to create um, an opportunity. In my sabbatical project, thanks to those who know, uh, to, to, um, to Jay, and those of you who know Jay, who's on the, uh, been on the Zoom um, Bible study courses on a Wednesday, he, my American friend sent me these T-shirts. They're a bit worn out now because I've been using them since 2019, and they're, they're getting a bit soggy. But on the front, it says, open hearts, open minds, open doors. And on the back, it says, we believe we should all play nicely together, the people of the United Methodist Church. And I used these T-shirts and various other bits and pieces to create opportunity to talk to people. So I put on my shirt, I would sit on a train or a station or in a cafe with something that might tr attract attention. Sometimes it was entirely accidental. I once, in one of the stories I'll probably reference later, um, I once had a copy of the Methodist worship book just because I was trying to organise a service for the end of my sabbatical in Devon. And I thought, well, I'll plan it. And I had the Methodist worship book out and somebody walked up to me and said, ha-ha, I recognize that. That's a Methodist worship book. 
and I was so thrown that I almost denied it. <laughs> no, 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 it isn't. It's just a book. So sometimes you can create an opportunity. Sometimes the opportunity is there. Vulnerability is simply the fact that if you're going to talk to somebody, you probably want to be connected to the same situation that they're in. If you're going to talk to people on a train, it's a good idea if you're willing to travel on the train. I'm not saying it's exclusively that, but if you are going to be talking to somebody about a delayed train, it's a good idea if you know what it's like to be on a delayed train. It's even better if you're on the same delayed tra train as them and they say to you, oh gosh, you must be struggling too. And you try not to sit there and look smug and just say, well, I'm on sabbatical, so I don't care. But anyway. So personality, opportunity, and vulnerability are three key parts of all chaplains' journeys. That you are who you are. You are in an opportunity in a place that's not the church. You're being vulnerable in that you're placing yourself out in the community, which does have risks, which we will come to later. I'll have the next slide if it's all right with you. What have we got next? Ah, yes. Look, I put this in. <laughs> this is me on a model railway train, okay? That's outside Feezy Church. Um, we're not just playing. This is for real. The, the reason I'm saying that is because, look, if we don't crack this business about engaging with a modern world, I don't mean this church or Kings Langley or Harpenden or whatever, but the model of the church nationally is not working. We're not open on the whole. And this is why I said you can't think of me as me. I'm being a mission enabler tonight. I'm not saying about this church or that church. <coughs> I'm saying that the model of the church, as we have it in Britain at the moment, is open at the wrong times for when people are available. It's in the wrong places. Uh, people are transient and we stay still. And if we don't crack it, the world will slowly move away from the church. Not because of anything terrible that we've done, but simply because they all moved and we didn't. I mean, you've, you've all seen the lineup thing, haven't you? Where everybody takes a step and the one person that volunteers is the one that's left because they didn't move. Well, in some ways, we're the only one left because everybody else took a step somewhere else and we just stayed where we were. Now, lots of churches, including this one here, of course, are doing lots of really good stuff with mission. But that's about here and this locale. In terms of a national picture, in terms of the bigger picture, we have to crack how we engage with people beyond the walls of the church. So that's one of the things I'm also suggesting for tonight. Okay, next slide, please. This is to remind me where I've got to, you see. The stories. Okay. The way I explored this through chaplaincy was I simply took down verbatim stories that were told to me and things that I encountered on my trip. I spent a month spending a thousand pounds of the Methodist Church's money traveling everywhere I possibly could from Penzance to Bonn in Germany to uh, Sorrento and, and all over the place. And um, this was our first trip on my kind of universal ticket. Uh, that's Becky and Ruth hiding because they didn't want to be in the photo. And we were off to Stratford-on-Avon. Um, and so we had a little trip on the train. That was our, our starting point. So the stories. Uh, if I have the next slide. Um, <laughs> I'd, I'd really intended that the whole thing was going to be about railways. And then in the middle of my sabbatical, I won an award I won a photography award, and that's my, my photograph that I took of a canal boat going through a tunnel, and that's me giving a, journey, a story about dark and light as a talk at Gloucester Transport Museum. And I suppose that's there as a thing to say, sometimes as chaplains, I think it's important that we go with the flow. Forgive the pun, flow, boat. No, okay. It was worth a go. Um, it, I think it's important that we go with the flow because sometimes something might crop up. This wasn't on my agenda. And suddenly I was in Gloucester and giving a talk. And of course it was a really good opportunity to witness to what I believed. Uh, next slide, please. Not everywhere I went, not everywhere I went was sophisticated, beautiful, uh, and uh, some sophisticated place that I could end up. Um, this... 
<laughs> this, ladies and gentlemen, is the canal bridge next to Bescott Railway Station, just by the M5, M6 junction, below Warsaw and above Birmingham. Um, I can't think of any other word to give you for it than rough. It's a rough neck of the woods. And I was catching the train and somebody ended up having a conversation with me on this bridge before I'd even caught the train. But then I caught the train to London, which was another, uh, believe me, I went from one rough end of Birmingham to the rough end of London. And I got, was on the tube train having, and there was this person on the tube train who started talking to me. I'd been wearing my, my shirt and they said, oh, that's a lovely message. Open hearts, open minds, open doors. Oh, gosh, I, 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 yes. I wish my church, I wish my church was like that. And so we started having a chat. And then the next thing I know, she's followed me off of the tube train and onto the road. And I stood outside this London tube train, tube station, and, and I'm saying to her, oh, well, um, it's lovely. You know, when you're trying to sort of leave politely, which way are you going? And I'm waiting. I'm hoping she'll go that way and I'll go that way. And she just looked at me and she said, you know all that stuff you were saying about church? Now, there's a little bit of me that's still the old-fashioned evangelist. I'm waiting for her to say, you know, you know you were saying about church. Well, I, I want to commit my life to God. I'm ready to put my hand on her head and go, bless you, my child. Well, of course, that wasn't what happened. What happens was she said, C could you do me a favor? Um, she said, would you, would you walk with me to, um, to, to this place? Now, I have to warn you in advance. Some of these stories, they have things in them that might be a bit triggering for people. So just, just be warned. I'll try and treat it as lightly as possible. Some of these things are pretty hefty. She says to me, um, would you walk with me? I said, I, I, uh, uh, yes, okay. Um, I really need to... No, okay, we'll go for a walk. And what it was was that she'd been abused in her home church when she was a teenager. And she'd lived in the same area all her life, disproving my wonderful theory that everybody moves around. And she'd lived all her life in this one area, and there was one road she could never go down because it was the road with the church. And if we could have the next slide, and this was the church. And it's a pretty dull, ordinary-looking church somewhere in London. And um, I took a picture of it because it had had such a profound effect on her life that she couldn't walk past this building anymore. But she thought that maybe with me, she could walk past it. So I said, okay, let's, let's, we'll, we'll walk past the church. And we had this wonderful discussion about how it was just a boring church. I mean, it's probably a very nice church or whatever and all the rest of it. And, it, and this stuff had happened to her a decade ago or 20 years ago or something. But we dispelled the mythology that that road was an impossible place to go along. So as a chaplain, effectively, all I was doing was literally taking a walk with her, quite literally and physically. Let's just go for a walk. I'm going to tell you a story now because it's important we get into the stories before I run out of, before I run out of time. So I'm going from place to place. Can we have the next slide? Thank you. Um, not all my stories were sad. This is an ice cream in Banbury. Ice cream in Banbury looks much like ice cream in any other place. It was in a gelato Italian style restaurant in Banbury. And I took a picture of it because that was the cafe that's almost directly opposite Banbury Railway Station. And it's where I met the two people in my story, uh, the first one of my little tales for tonight. It's the second one, really. We don't travel by train normally. We go by car, don't we, dear? He nods his assent to her premise. They are two seriously bright young people, both about 25 years old. They whistled through topics of such a rate that I had barely opened my sandwiches before they've weighed up my whole project. You see, I had a series of questions to ask people. What do you think of having, like, a railway chaplaincy on a railway station? How would it, you know, what would help you? What do you think? They'd gone through it before I'd even managed to talk to them. They were literally going through, oh, yes, we can talk about this. She said, but I don't see why it wouldn't just also work in a motorway services station as well. They proceed to tell me a story of the world's worst traffic jam and a trip home from work that took five hours. 
Not all trips have been to exotic places like Paris or Bonn. Mostly it's been journeys in and around the UK. This young couple in a railway station near Banbury were Christians and seemed enthusiastic about the ideas. For them, it was the existential crisis that presented the clincher. To summarise, and to quote a song, they were at this should I stay or should I go now point in their lives. You know the song? Should I stay or should I go now? Yeah. Journeys are littered with people leaving someone, visiting someone, missing someone, deciding to mend a relationship, or just plain running away. You'd have to have a badge, they said, or a hat or something, so that people knew that you were someone that they could talk to. Other practical solutions that they offered, including having somewhere where people could charge up a phone. You know, if you're stuck on a five-hour journey when you expected to be out for three quarters of an hour, your phone's going to go dead and you're going to run out of food. Their five-hour epic had caused exactly that issue. See, if you went out unprepared for a long delay, then a space to chat and to charge a phone would be a vital resource. A space to sit and chat calmly when things have gone really wrong could be life-changing. It was sad in some ways that we had such a short time together. People like them throwing out all these God-given answers to your prayers and questions is very reassuring and helpful. But trains come and people go. They left me with one final challenge. Their lives were now often acted out as a continuous series of transient states. His parents this week, her parents next week, the commute to work, oh, and all of their friends getting married around different parts of the country. It, ironically, COVID happened just after this and everyone stayed home. It's a social life split between two major cities and burgeoning international careers. They barely get to go to church at all, let alone visit the one near their house. Maybe church, for some people, needs to be in the places they pass through. Community is no longer a geographically static entity. I have the next slide. So I'm going to crack straight on with the second story. So you get the idea. I was just talking to people in stations and asking them, what's their problem with church? Do they go? Are they interested in church? Um, where do they think God fits into all of this? So if I can find the second one. Um, oh, that, one's, that one looks dodgy to me. What's that one say? Another day, another station. I've got it. Eurostar. You can't see it from there, can you? But that actually says Eurostar on it, and I, I was off abroad. I was going off on an exciting trip. The queue for the Eurostar was much longer than I expected. Sophia was trying very hard to keep control of two bright but excessively lively children. I think we've all been there. She also seemed to be trying to find her missing tickets and passport. At one point, she asked me to keep an eye on her luggage as she takes the two small panes off to the toilet. Sophia is from Nebraska in the USA, and she has a very different idea of privacy than I do. I make a mental note to um, mention this conversation to my mentor when I get back. Um, how do you make something like this, where somebody starts talking to you about their life in an open public space and are not doing anything to protect themselves, they're just telling you everything is in their minds? How do you safeguard that? I don't know, other than recording that it happened. Sophia's story went a bit like this. She had graduated from Yale with a good degree. She quickly established herself in journalism. And as if she was trying to follow every cliche in the book, she dated and then married her boss. At first, it all seemed to be fine. Yes, he was a bit of an alpha male. And yes, he didn't do diaper changes and domesticity. On the whole, though, it was a dream marriage. In fact, uh, had she never asked anything of him, they might still be married now. Life, though, is not like that. As the children grew and she returned to work, he appeared unable to do anything to help. Increasingly, even the smallest demand from her met with opposition. For her, there was also a steady realization that he controlled everything about her life. She wasn't allowed friends of her own. Uh, he was making sure that she couldn't go out to work. And he dictated everything and anything to do with money. 
Later on in a follow-up conversation, I also discovered that he'd said that if she didn't have an abortion at one point, that, she would end, that he would end the marriage. As the tale went on, I listened in some awe as she described the life that she had endured. He had another relationship and had tried to convince her that she was mad for challenging him. He became threatening and abusive and increasingly secretive. In order to maintain the myth, he would spread lies and stories about her, turning her family against her and constantly claiming that he would take the children away if she complained. Finally, when she caught him red-handed with another woman, he claimed it was all a mental health problem and guilt had tripped her into staying for another year because it was something that he could be cured of. I was glad to hear, and I'm sure you'll be glad to hear, that that nightmare, nightmare is now over. Her and the children are much happier in their new home and their new life. I asked, uh, um, considering that all she was telling me in this station en route to Paris, whether having someone to talk to or some support from the church back then would have helped. She somewhat surprised me by saying, I'll try and do the accent, I'm not sure I can, she kind of said, not then so much as now. I go twice a year to visit the arsewipe so he can stay in touch with his children. The mention of them reminded me that they were still there, running circles around the luggage, their ambition apparently to thwack each other with souvenir flags from the Tower of London. My attorney, she said, and the medics all tell me that I shouldn't do it and that his sociopathic tendencies are unlikely to change. He uses every visit to accuse me of some new crime and stirs it all up again with everyone. He treats the children like pawn in a game, pawns in a game. I just wondered if you had any advice. You know, you being a vicar and all. <laughs> what sort of advice do you mean? Well, you know, moral advice. Surely the Bible says that they should honor their mother and father. She was nodding towards the children. I thought for a while. I pointed out that I'm hardly qualified in such matters. I found every excuse under the book. After all, if the doctors and the lawyers think that it's a bad idea, I suspect it probably is a bad idea. The queue had started to move. I figured that anything useful I could say had a very specific time limit. So I offered a personal opinion. Look, ultimately, I can't tell you what to do, and anything I say is based only on personal experience. Morally, you say? Well, my father wasn't around much when I was a child either. I hated that passage about honoring your mother and father, and because it was in the Ten Commandments, it sort of haunted me. Well, in those days, I used to visit an elderly lady called Edith. My nan thought it was so that I could do odd jobs for her but it often turned out as an opportunity to get help with my problems. Edith was a genius about most things, especially relationships. When I asked her about that passage, honour your mother and father, she said, who is your father? I'm a fairly literal child, and so I immediately try and explain who my dad is, literally. And she says, no, no, no. Of all the people in your life, who is your father? Did your dad bring you up? Uh, was he around literally? Did he feed you and cook for you or buy clothes for you? Well, of course he didn't. He was in Turkey at the time, I think, or Dubai or, or wherever. He was never at home. So who is your father? To honour a parent, they have to actually be a parent. Parenthood is not just a biological thing, it's a love thing. Maybe someone who is willing to sacrifice children to make a point isn't their father. Can we have the next slide? I'm going to try and move through a, a few of these quickly because I already feel like I'm running out of time. I've got one more story for you to just give you an idea of what they are. This was the best. This was such a fantastic bit of the journey. I spent a few days in Paris. It was 40 degrees. It was also Pride Festival week. And it was so beautiful. That's Notre Dame Cathedral when it was being repaired. Um, and uh, I was staying just round the corner from Notre Dame. And uh, there's a story that goes with this. Um, please bear with me. This is the last one. All right. Well, the last one for today anyway. Um, this story, it really comes under the heading of risk. See, if you put yourself out in the community, of course, things could go a bit, um, well, things might not go the way you think they're going to go. 
And my friend in Paris wanted me to experience real Paris life, okay? She wanted me to know what Paris was really like. So this is my story from that, from Paris, Notre Dame. Vanessa's is a pretty standard street cafe. Well, for Paris at least. Hidden among the growing gay village of the fourth arrondissement, it's just far enough away from the more familiar tourist traps to be quite peaceful. You'd pass it by easily, dismissing it as quaint. You, though, I suspect, have not sat there. You have not sat there with your strong coffee and the smell of those cheap cigars and cigarettes drifting up from the eclectic clientele. But then also, you probably don't owe Michelle money. The cafe has a little bar tucked away in the dark behind four tables, its umbrellas on the pavement providing the sanctuary from 40 degree heat. The atmosphere is relaxed to the point of inertia. Traffic does not bother squeezing its way down here so often, so if you ignore the occasional use of a mobile phone, Vanessa's could have existed in almost any era back to the war. I cannot help but feel that I have fallen into something written by Ian Fleming or by Jean Le Carrier. Vanessa herself is tall and dark and gives the impression that she knows that she's attractive but she can't really be bothered to do anything about it. When she offers to get you a coffee, it's her place after all. She doesn't even go behind the bar. She just leans over it and makes the drinks from there, making sure that you have a good shot of her bottom as she leans over. In contrast, Michelle is animated and bright-eyed. He's reveling in the conversation. He jumps from English to German and French without batting an eyelid. He's amusing in all languages. People passing hail him. Michel, Michel. There's a genuine laughter between him and various people that keep appearing. Occasionally, somebody walks over to him and hands him money. Great big rolls of money. Sometimes some pretty big denominations. My friend has brought me here as a good place to breathe in the real Paris. Here I can meet and talk to strangers about life, God, and despite, despite, this was when this was current, uh, dis, despite my determination to avoid it, Brexit. I can't help but wonder what I've stumbled into. The coffee is excellent. I sit with my new friend, Michelle, just taking it all in. Vanessa joins us. Her body language implies that she might be intimate with Michelle, or at least that they've known each other forever. My French is limited to 1970s school CSE, a book called A La Page, which was a book fixated entirely on the life of some cat. Où est Mimi? Qui est Mimi? Mimi est le chat. Le chat est dans le jardin. <laughs> This, I'm sorry, this is, this is not uh, good enough to cover the topics that I need to discuss. Luckily, I am an erudite company. Soon, I am throw, throwing in my desperately limited eight words of French, ten words of German, and increasingly reduced use of English to a complex discussion in three languages. There is gesturing, and the point is clear. There is a God, and yes, you should have to go to church to meet him. So I chance my arm. So Michelle, how often do you go to church? He responds sharply with a well thought out answer. I go the number of times I owe. You must do what God requires of you and the rest is up to you. For Michelle, it seems religion is also part of another deal a cash negotiation. You must do what God asks, go when he calls, and give unto God what is God's, and then get away with anything else that you possibly can. Vanessa is a little bit more sanguine. I believe in Jesus, and I would go to church, but church people don't like me. I try saying that my church would like her, but in all honesty, with my limited French, it sounds like I'm flirting. 
Besides, I'm not in all honesty sure that the churches I would take her to would be comfortable with her. She's a pretty tough character. She's got all these little tattoos and she smokes these uh, occasional galois. And, and even the way she walks and the way she dressed. I wondered to myself what on earth we would need to do to a church to make it a safe place for someone like that to come to. As Michelle drifts briefly off to sort out another transaction, I grab a quick moment with Vanessa. What does Michelle do, I ask? She winks at me and says, he's a comedian. Well, he's certainly that, but I think he's another sort of funny guy, you know? I think... I think I, I, I try and tell her that I'm writing some stories about encounters just like this. And she sounds interested for a second. She seems like she's just about to tell me something really important and personal. And then she realizes that I'm not from here and that the risk is too great. I, I would have to be here tomorrow and the next day and maybe for months. But then I think she might have a really profound story to tell. Later on, as we depart, the awkward truth gains a voice. Michelle puts his hand on my shoulder and points out very clearly to me, I am no less French because I live in Europe. He doesn't understand Brexit, but then nor do I. He says he'll be praying for my situation. The irony is not lost on me. That's the last one of the stories because we otherwise will completely run out of time. Um, I'm going to skip through a few slides very, very quickly to get us to nearer the end. Can I have the next one? Um, we went to Germany. I did similar things in Germany. Just keep clicking through them, uh, Lindsay. Uh, we saw the, the, the card. This is the card from the pocket of JFK when he gave his Ich bin ein Berliner speech. It's written out in phonetics so that he could read it out. Um, and, and that's that picture. Next one, please. We went to the Rhine. Next one, please. Uh, as you can see, the 40-degree heat and the Rhine water level was really, really shallow and everyone was worried about it. Next one. Yeah, it's similar. Uh, next slide. Um, one of the stories I'll tell you on another occasion was, if you can see top left, there's two girls up there. And we were by a brook. And um, they came and talked with the mums, the, the two girls' mothers. See, they had two mums, um, came and talked to me about, about things. And that was another story that we collected on the way. Next one, please. This was the water gardens in Bonn. Absolutely beautiful. Next. <laughs> phone book, book, book exchange in Germany, in a British phone book, phone box. So you could take your book along and swap it for another one. Just really funny seeing a British phone box in a German village. Next one. German villages. It was very nice. Uh, next one. This is me and my, um, and my friend. This has is, this is just turned into a slideshow now, hasn't it? Um, this, this was 40-degree uh, heat on the Rhine, and uh, we had our cool shades on, and we were, you know, we were having a lovely time. Next slide. We don't walk alone for various reasons. I, I, I just, not only do we walk with God when we do these things, but it's kind of important that if you're going to talk to people like I was meeting and talking to, it's probably a good idea not to be doing it on your own. Next one, please. Not everything is what it seems. Can you see the elephant? Can you see how flimsy the fence is between us and the elephant? That elephant's made of metal. He's a metal elephant. Next one, please. Um, how German is this? This is a German village with a German beetle. And it was just like, but sometimes things are what they seem. Next, please. This was the elephant in the room, or the elephant on the train. You talk to people, don't expect all the topics to be the ones you expect to get. That is a war memorial to fallen Nazis. And the village has never taken it down, and it still sits there in the middle of the village, and nobody knows what to do with it. Basically, everyone develops a nasty cough in the village as they walk past it. <coughs> yes, well, uh, it's a pity it's still there, but we don't know what to do with it. Let's move on. Next slide. Oh, this was a monastery. It was absolutely beautiful. Next slide, please. Another train, another day. All these conversations just took place either on trains or next to the trains or in the stations. Next one, please. And I ended my 
trip, well, the first part, the main part of my trip by going down to Devon. Next slide, please. And doing the same, <clears throat> talking to folks in Devon. Next one. And um, this is a cafe, and I don't know if you can see on the sign, but I was talking to someone in the cafe, and the sign says Sorrento. So next slide, please. So then we went to Sorrento. Not really, because it was on the cafe, but anyway. And so we finished up by going to Sorrento, which was incredibly Catholic and beautiful and lovely. Next slide, please. And guess what? Eventually, if you go to enough cafes, you'll find yourself in an Italian version of where we started out from in Banbury. I have to say the ice cream was absolutely wonderful. Next slide, please. And this was the Circumvesuviana Railway, which goes all the way around Vesuvius. And there's lots of stories to do with that as well, because Vesuvius is in an incredibly poor area. And uh, some of the people we met there were incredible. Next slide, please. This was just wonderful. This getting to know people was just fantastic. We talked to so many people in Sorrento. Can you see the bride? She's walking through the middle of the town square and all the traffic has stopped. And a photographer was there photographing her walking across the road. And the whole wedding party are just over there. And no, no horns being blown, nobody complaining. She's getting married, therefore the world stops for her. And it was just this beautiful moment where everybody just stopped because the bride walked through. Next slide. Thank you. Okay. Here's my point. On that trip, I met so many people. There is a wadge of stories there. I'll tell you more stories in other, on other occasions. The premise I want to put to you is quite simple. We close churches regularly now around the country. We've lost, um, what was the one? Um, um, uh, just Mark Yeat. Thank you. I wanted to call it something else. I can't, I don't know why. Anyway, Mark Yates. I think, I believe that what we should do, and I'll do an abbreviated version of this, but what I believe that we should do is when we close a church, we should open a chaplaincy. It should be national Methodist policy that every time a church closes, we should put a church facility on a railway station, in a bus station, uh, wherever the nearest transport hub is. If that's the canal, then put one on the canal. But you put a facility by a transport place, and the money from the sale of the church, in part, has to go to the running of that. Alongside that, I think we have a fantastic opportunity because we are, I don't know how many of you are card-carrying members of the Methodist Church. Has that bit of cardboard ever done anything useful for you? Did you ever get 10% off at Debenhams or wherever? No. I am going to suggest that along with putting up facilities in places, we work out how we can staff those facilities by changing the Methodist card system. I want us to have Methodist gold cards. I want us to have a card that actually does something. Mostly, we get tired of doing stuff in church because it's stuff that we don't normally want to do. And we do it just because everybody needs us to do this job or that job. Actually, mission usually happens when we're doing something that we love because we're happier. I, like, I went on trains because I like going on trains. It was no hardship for me to spend a month traveling around Europe on trains. And of course, it was missional because I was having such a wonderful time. If we had gold cards that required us to be trained and required us to be DBS checked up to the eyeballs and meant that we were safe people to talk to. And if people knew that holding a Methodist gold card meant that you were someone that was approachable, or like my friend suggested, maybe you have the hat or the badge or something, but you've got your card to prove that you are somebody who is a responsible member of the community or as near as we can get. And those cards would also have a magic trick up their sleeve because they would give you access to any one of the facilities on any railway station or any place where we'd built a Methodist chaplaincy on a railway station. So if you were on a train and the train got delayed and you're ending up in a conversation and somebody says, 
I need a phone, I need a charger, I've broken my shoe, um, I could do with a coffee and the coffee shop is closed. You become empowered as a person to say, come on, we've got this place. It could be a nice glass building, nice and safe, so that people could see in and it wouldn't be dodgy and it would have nice sofas and a coffee machine and somewhere where we could take people if they wanted to have a conversation. And it would enable us, if we chose to do so, for every single one of us to be chaplains. So that instead of there being a chaplain, there are currently 164,000 Methodists in Britain. It's a big club. If only 10% of them wanted to upgrade to a gold card, you'd have 16,000 chaplains. Of course, you wouldn't be using it all the time and we'd probably have to work out a system where you had an app on your phone or something so that you could check in or whatever. But I believe that there could be a system whereby we could really do what we believe as Methodists, which is to have the priesthood of all believers. That anyone who was in the Methodist church who wanted to be involved, if they happened to be on a journey, if they happened to find themselves somewhere, they could take out their gold card and say, I'm a safe person to talk to. I see that you're stuck. Can I help you? And I think we could do something that would look like the old Salvation Army used to do, where they could go anywhere and everyone would know what they were and what they were doing. So that was my thought. Let's move the church away from the model we've had before. Let's all be chaplains. Not just me, but everybody. And we can all be a chaplain in the world and have our Methodist gold cards. There's so much more I want to tell you, but it would take another hour. So I'm going to stop. I'll... Um, I'll hand back and, um, uh, yes, I'll shut up now. <laughs> There's uh, 20 of those stories, 20, 25 of those stories. Did you really think you were going to be able to... I'm going to... Oh, losing my voice. Did you really... That's not... That's not... Hang on. I'm not sure... Oh, yeah, that, thank you. I was going to say, did you really think you were going to be able to tell all 22 of them? No, no, I, I did think I might get through a few more than that, but I, I yeah, yeah. Now, in theory, um, we're going to open up for quarter of an hour questions. I will open up because I think people may have some, some comments or questions, and so I, I will do that in a moment. Um, but first... Um, I want to say thank you. You have an amazing ability for presenting something very challenging in a very entertaining way. Thank you. Um, and I thank you for that. And just invite everybody to show their appreciation for what we've heard so far. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. And now, comments, questions, responses to the challenge? It was absolutely brilliant. Thank you. So Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> when you get on a train, you have a choice of facing forwards or backwards. Which way do you choose to sit? <laughs> um, I always face the other way to where the other person wants to sit. Because uh, my wife always has to sit facing forward. And when I'm with my son, he always likes to, to loll back in the seat, going backwards, so that he can kind of pass out. Um, well, if you're on your own, where would you sit? Oh, if I was on my own, where would I sit? I would sit on the floor <laughs> in the aisle um, by the doors where they open. I often used to do that when I was a teenager. I used to sit on the, the floor of the trains. I like the sound and the vibration of sitting there, and, and you just get absorbed into the sound. And also, that bit's usually not very crowded, so when the rest of the train is crowded, I like to sit in the, that bit. That's where I like to be. <laughs> that was a tougher question to answer than I thought. I was genuinely trying to answer it. I was thinking, well, where do I sit? But actually, if I'm, if I'm on my own, I tend to sit in the corridor. or in the bike rack. You silence them. Yeah. Uh, in a moment, we're going to pray. Um, and I want, if I can, us to, pr well, if we can, to, to encompass some of the situations you've talked about, but also the challenge that you've set us as a church. But I, I, just to, to go to something that 
I'm aware of. Uh, in actual fact, I, I was on a train last year that was delayed <laughs> with a lot of other people for a long time because there was a fatality on the line. Yeah. Um, and I also recall my dad, who worked for the railways, coming in some days and it being clear that he wasn't right, although he never said in front of me why he wasn't right. And it's only now that I think about it that I think there probably was a fatality on the line. Mm. And not only the family and the friends of those people will be affected by that, but the people who literally had to pick up the pieces. And... <laughs> That one's not working. Oh, yeah, I'll put it on there. Um, and wherever we may travel, there will always be people in difficult situations. And we may not be able to find the right answer, but we can be there, can't we? Um, and somehow try to be there for people and be the people who can listen and pray. And, and can I say, I think that's an important thing, that thing about people fear when they're doing witnessing to their belief and so on, um, that we think that we're going to have a right answer. And I mean, if that thing with the lady from Nebraska proved anything, was that I didn't even see the question coming. And when she asked me the question, I ended up just telling her another story. I hope it worked, but I, I have no way of knowing. And in another circumstance, I thought I was making a joke with somebody. And we were in the queue to the... Um, cafe on the train, you know, the, uh, what they call it, buffet. And I was in the buffet car, and uh, the buffet wasn't open. And this person behind me went right off the deep end. Oh, how dare they close it? It's because we crossed from France into to Germany, or Belgium into Germany. And they just closed it to change staff. And it took about ten minutes to change the staff, from, from the French staff to the German staff. Uh, or Belgian staff. And this person was just going, oh, crumbs, it wouldn't happen in Britain. And I thought, well, you haven't travelled on a... <laughs> Would, it wouldn't happen in Britain, is, is this thing. And they were absolutely fuming. And as they stepped out of the queue to go and write their complaint on the phone or put it on social media, the person behind me I turned to, it was a lady, she was about five foot one, and I felt like I was towering over her, and I turned around and I looked at her, and she just went... Like that. <laughs> And I said, crumbs going off the handle when they just can't get a sandwich. And we started this stupid question and answer thing where she was saying, let's talk about things that are, are, are more important than not being able to get a sandwich on a railway train. It was just like a series of jokes. And right in the middle of it, I'm sorry, this is a blunt one to throw in at the end, but right in the middle of it, and we're joking away, and we're saying that just about anything in the world is more important than that. She just suddenly said to me, well, of course, when my husband raped me, it changed the whole, it destroyed the whole of my life. And I just heard myself going, well, that's a bit more important than a sandwich, isn't it? And we had to go and find somewhere to talk, and we found a space, space to talk. And that came out of, and if you think I had the right answer to that one, I mean, I literally just stood there and was like, Right. Uh, shall we talk? You know. Anyway, that was uh, you know just a, just an aside. But what a shock that was! That came out of a joke about sandwiches. Mm. So it, maybe the answer is just bacon, lettuce, and tomato. <laughs> Let's pray. <laughs> Loving God, we thank you for Andrew and for what he has shared with us tonight and for his ability to be able to relate to people and give them the opportunity to in some way say what they need to say. And we pray that each of us may be able to respond when those things happen appropriately. That if we need to say something, you'll give us the words to say. And if we need to do something, you'll give us the means to do it. We thank you for the challenge that's been posed. The challenge that we need to be going out, 
traveling with others, being where they are. And we pray too for the people who are really struggling, for some of those situations that we can imagine and that we've heard about, where the only person that they've been able to share that with is a complete stranger. And so as we go on our way tonight, not as strangers, but as friends and as children of God, we pray that you will enable us to truly be that kind of chaplain wherever you place us with whoever comes our way. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.